Okay, good evening, everybody. All right. Welcome to the everybody to the Trinity Western University Sustainability Series and tonight's event on planetary health. I'd like to begin by coming to our Creator in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to meet, to have fellowship, and to discuss how to serve you and to support your creation more effectively. We pray for strength and insight for all of our speakers and wisdom for all of us here to engage. May your will be done as we wrestle with the issues and find ways to be more helpful as your hands in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. I forgot to mention who I am. I'm Glenn, everyone, um, <laughs> uh, representing the Faculty of Natural and Applied Sciences. Um, now, I'd like to do our land acknowledgement, and given the context of today's uh, event, this has an extra poignancy. So, we gratefully acknowledge that the land on which we meet tonight is the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Stolo people. And now, a word from our sponsors. Um, this, uh, there are several organizations who made it possible for us to be here tonight. The first, which until about 10 minutes ago, I thought was science and Christianity, uh, in Oxford, in fact, is scholarship and Christianity in Oxford. Um, and this organization has for a number of years organized all sorts of events for scholars all over North America to explore the interactions between science and faith. And several people in this room have participated in that. Um, uh, how, how does one pronounce the acronym? SCIO? SCIO? SCIO. I'll go with SCIO. Uh, SCIO, a couple of years ago, organized an opportunity for a large institutional research grant called Supporting Structures. The idea is that scientists who participate within the context of a Christian university often don't have the opportunity to use the kinds of hugely expensive research tools that are available at big research universities. So, in fact, uh, this grant permits up to three faculty members at a Christian university to have the funding to work in a larger research setting at, at a university that has all of this equipment. Um, this, um, we were one of nine universities across North America who were awarded this grant, and the only one in Canada. I need a woohoo for that. Thank you. <laughs> and I'd also like to thank, once again, uh, Professor David Clements for spearheading this grant. He's been enormously busy and it's been wonderful. Thank you very much, David. <laughs> um, the grant is for three years and each year there is a faculty fellow that gets half of their teaching load uh, released so that they can do this research. Last year, our year one faculty fellow was Professor Shane Durbach, who you will hear tonight. This year, our faculty fellow is Professor Laura Onyango at the back of the room. And yeah, you can applaud for all three once you've heard who they are. <laughs> okay. And the third next year will be Professor uh, Dr. Richard Chandra. So you may now applaud for all three. All right. Now, the funds for this grant, which were about $230,000, uh, came from two organizations, the Templeton Foundation and the Murdoch Charitable Trust, and we're extremely grateful for that opportunity. The other organization that has helped make tonight possible is the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation, and I'd like to invite uh, Arnold Sukuma forward to describe that. Right. Well, thank you very much, Glenn, and thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, so my name is Arnold Sukuma. I teach physics here at Trinity Western. And I'm also the executive director of the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation, which is a national organization in Canada connecting scientists who are Christians. And we're affiliated with our U.S. partners, the American Scientific Affiliation. Um, and we have all sorts of great opportunities for students, especially. So student membership is free. And students' uh, registration costs for the conference, which this year is in Mississauga, in Toronto, uh, is also free. And if you're presenting there, as I hope at least one of you will, uh, you also get a 75% reduction in your lodging and meals uh, cost. So um, 
we really encourage students to think about how to network with scientists who are Christians in in as they move on into their careers out, out of Trinity Western. Here, you've got your, all of your faculty are Christians, and so not too hard to find someone. But if you're becoming a graduate student in Regina or something like that, who, who will you connect with? Well, you'll join the CSCA and you'll find out who in Regina on the membership list is 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 there with you who can be a mentor in science and Christianity. So a student membership is free, so do sign up. Uh, the website is listed on this uh, banner here uh, somewhere, csea.ca, and you can sign up to be on a mailing list. You can join as a member. And if you're not a student anymore, then please join as a paying member to help make all this uh, possible. So uh, we sponsor events like this in uh, all across Canada, and we have a Vancouver chapter along with another 10 chapters in uh, other cities across the country. So uh, we're happy to help uh, support this kind of an event. So there is uh, still a couple of sponsors that uh, Dr. Van Brummelen didn't mention, um, our own um, science faculty here, and then uh, TWEC, which stands for Trinity Western Environmental Club. And later you'll be hearing from members of the club. And I just want to uh, kind of outline what we're going to be talking about tonight and, and introduce the first three, the, the three main speakers. Uh, first, I just want to mention um, Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And I think that's what you're going to see tonight is the confluence of everything and how important it is to steward our earth and the earth is the lord's we're just trying our best to take care of it the very first speaker is barbara astel um so dr astel has a phd in nursing from university of alberta masters from university of alberta and also a bachelor's from the same university and so she's very albertan but but uh, hold on. <laughs> um, if you hear where her memberships are, you'll see she goes well beyond Alberta, and she's gracing us here in British Columbia right now. Um, she is a registered nurse with um, the BC College of Nurses and Midwives, co-director and founding member of our Center for Equity and Global Engagement here, so global. Uh, founding member of Women in Global Health, the Canadian chapter, um, member of the Gender Equity Hub, Women in Global Health, um, member of Canadian Society for International Health. Uh, and if I were to introduce her properly, um, we'd take up the whole evening. But what she's going to talk about, I'll, I'll leave it there. She can, she'll fill in more, I'm sure. But um, she is going to be just answering that simple question, what is planetary health? because we're hoping at Trinity Western to do even more with that. And we even have many big ideas. You might may or may not hear about like having a conference next year on planetary health. You heard it first just a minute ago here. So that's our first speaker. And uh, so she's from Alberta. And then we have um, the... Uh, Next speaker is from South Africa. So Dr. Durbach in chemistry is the first fellow in our um, series of fellows. So he got half time off last year and he went to Saskatchewan. So that's pretty global. But for him, it's nothing because he's from South Africa and he works on very tiny things, though. Uh, in fact, both of the planetary health scientists here will be talking about tiny things. Um, so we're going to hear about nanoparticles and how these tiny things can help us save the world. And then the third speaker is a microbiologist. And um, so Dr. Durbach got all his degrees in South Africa, but um, with uh, Dr. Anyango, she spread out her degrees a little bit more. Um, she did her PhD at University of Newcastle in Australia um, and also her graduate diploma in science. But her BSc um, was in a place called Redeemer University College. Anyone know where that is? It's Canada. So uh, Hamilton, 
Canada or Hamilton area. And so we're so privileged to have her talk about microbiology. Um, and she's actually collaborating with Dr. Durbach. So it's really interesting to have the three of them. And so I'll introduce the new generation when they come later. But we want to start off by welcoming Dr. Astle. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the lovely introduction, and thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak about planetary health, sustaining our future, a topic that I, as a nurse, am passionate about, and I've spent the better part of my nursing career uh, pondering various questions about why I continually see the ill effects on the health of my patients from wherever they may be located. Um, we've done, already done a land acknowledgement, but I do want to say that I'm so grateful for the opportunity to rem remember uh, those who have stewarded the land and those who I now work with alongside my students, colleagues, and friends on this land. The United Nations Secretary General in December 2022 um, echoed some words that I think are really, really important in terms of where we're going. He said, every new year is a moment of rebirth. We sweep out the ashes of the old year and prepare for a brighter day. In 2022, millions of people around the world literally swept out ashes. From Ukraine to Afghanistan to the Democratic Republic of the Con Congo and beyond, people left the ruins of their homes and lives in search of something better. Around the world, 100 million people were on the move fleeing war, wildfires, droughts, poverty, and hunger. In 2023, he stated at the beginning of this year, we need peace more than ever. Peace with one another through dialogue to end conflict. Peace with our climate to build a more sustainable world. Peace in the home so women and girls can live in dignity and safety, peace on the streets and communities with the full protection of all human rights. We live in a world right now where the health and well-being of humanity is directly impacted by the natural systems that we depend on. Over the past several years, we've experienced the devastating effects of climate change, biodiversity lost, and most recently, the global pandemic, some people talk about these as being the triple threat, including pollution. My students will know that. There is a sense of urgency. Such threats for health can have catastrophic effects on people living in poverty, living in disability, being displaced because of the examples that I've just alluded to. All of these occurrences place persons, many who are already disadvantaged, further structurally and disproportionately impacted. On the lower part of this pictorial that you're looking at, there is a picture of one of our graduate students in Tanzania. And the reason I bring this up is that I am part of a transdisciplinary research policy advocacy network working and addressing albinism and human rights. With the incidence of persons with albinism higher in certain geographical places in the world, like Sub-Saharan Africa, the impact of climate change makes them increasingly at risk for skin cancer. Recently, with my research partners, we published a paper about the global impact of climate change on persons with albinism, a human rights issue. One of the first papers to be published in this area. So more than ever, there's an urgency that we acknowledge and explore how the stewardship of the earth is a primary determinant of the health of humanity. And as a person of faith, our responsibility to address the complex planetary health challenges of the world today. And you can see that I've listed some there um, on the screen. So what is planetary health? In uh, 2015, the uh, Lancet Commission did a special edition on, on planetary health, and I happened to be there when it was actually unveiled, which is 
quite remarkable. So I've been speaking about planetary health since that time, but I must say many in my circles were wondering about what I was even talking about, actually. So what this has done, it has led to over the years, and that I've taught this in the past seven years in the courses, uh, the courses I teach in global health, now planetary health, has led to a large groundswell of interest in planetary health education emerging across many disciplines, institutions, and geographical regions. So stemming from this uh, commission that came out on planetary health was the Planetary Health Alliance, which is located at Harvard University in Boston. And they have been working on various efforts in this cross-cutting field. And one of the things that they have developed, and it really uh, it, it's, it has a Canadian connection because they were meeting in Canmore, Alberta, on what they developed were 12 cross-cutting cutting principles for planetary health based for curriculum development. And I won't go through those um, today, but that's important to mention that because that part of the work that emerged from that is part of the work that I'm going to talk to you that I have been involved with in terms of what's called the planetary health education framework. And so the Planetary Health Alliance here says planetary health is a solution oriented transdisciplinary field and social movement focused on analyzing and addressing the impacts of human disruptions to Earth's natural systems on human health and life on Earth. The definition that they came out in 2015 was the achievement, and you see this often, of the highest attainable standards of health and well-being and equity worldwide through judicious attention to the human systems, political, economic, and social, that shape the lives, shape the future of humanity and the Earth's natural systems that define the safe environmental limits with, within which humanity can flourish. So moving on, what we currently see in our world today is a growing mandate and imperative across higher education for inclusive, integrative, transformative and sometimes disruptive approaches to learning and strengthening our goals and imperatives of planetary health. There is this acknowledgement that if you're in global health, which I have been in for many years, or human development, you can no longer safeguard health, human health without stabilizing and regeneration of our natural support system. And it's interesting, um, with this We've got this emerging scientific field, and it's just been exploding. So, for example, we, we now have a European planetary health hub. We have a South um, East Asian planetary health, and I'm in direct communication with the, with the person that's uh, heading, uh, heading that up, and our next um, planetary health alliance meeting is going to actually be in Malaysia. So stay tuned. And the United Nations General Assembly has been, uh, at their particular meetings, have talked about the importance of integrating planetary health into higher education. And I'm currently working with a group of transdisciplinary scholars across Canada on a planetary health and well-being initiative at the policy level. And you'll hear more about that. We're currently having our environmental health two-day uh, conference in two weeks in Ottawa, and we will be unveiling some of that work. And I'd love to have uh, more conversations with my colleagues here about that. So moving forward, we have here um, this social movement rooted in indigenous ways of knowing, which I'm going to highlight, and this global transdisciplinary. We cannot answer these critical questions that are occurring by one discipline alone. So that is the important um, point that we're emphasizing with this type of work that we're doing. So what it's led is what we call the Great Transition, which is a fundamental shift in how people and human systems interact to shape the highest attainable standards for health of humanity and the state of Earth's natural systems. It's a transformation of values of human health and well-being on a healthy uh ecosystem. And one of the other things that I'm currently working on is the values and ethics for nursing for planetary health. And it's uh, kind of interesting because we're leading the way in that, and it'll be really interesting to see how that moves forward in terms of our um, other disciplines. So what I wanted to talk to you as we moved along, in 2019 in Brazil, we had um, 
the next Planetary Health Alliance uh, conference and came out with the Sao Paulo Declaration of Planetary Health, which is really a global call to action from the planetary health community. This planetary health community includes scientists, veterinarians, nurses, medicine, students, an array of many disciplines. And we have this most important that we work intersectorally. And what this um, is this particular um, declaration was that there was this consultation with approximately 300 of the participants from more than 70 countries um, that was supported by the United Nations Development Programs. And um, there was this urge to act now. And currently, there are 250 organizations that have signed on to this, 47 countries, and the declaration is available in multiple languages on their website if you're interested. So moving on, this is really important to think about the sustainable development goals. And so in 2015, the United Nations got together and put together a blueprint of for peace and prosperity for people and the planet. And what they came up here were 17 what we call sustainable development goals. And you can see number three has to do with health. Number 13 has to do with climate uh, change. Um, etc. So there's many that are not only scientifically related, but also related to health. And they recognize that these are things that that we we need to all look at, um, be involved with, whether it's developed or developing countries. The agenda was set for 2030. We know now that we're not going to meet all of these goals, but it is in front of our faces that this is really important. And out of this, um, particular framework was really the guide for the type of work that I'm going to talk to you about now in terms of the social ecological environment determinants of health and planetary health. So when I was thinking about this talk, I wanted to talk to you about what is planetary health. And then I really important definitive about the Sao Paulo Declaration, but also then I wanted to move on to a really important element of the work that I am doing and I developed um, on what's called the Planetary Health Education Framework. So there was a group of us that met um, at uh, uh, Stanford University. Now it's two and a half years ago. And many of us members of the Planetary Health Alliance and said, this is a movement, this is transformation, and how do we move forward on this? And so you'll see uh, depicted here is the cover of it. And then I'm going to specifically talk to you about these particular five domains. And they are focused on and based on the sustainable development goals and the intergovernmental science policy platform on biodiversity and ecosystems, which many of you in the uh, sciences are probably very familiar with. So you can see that here that there's uh, five domains, and in the middle, very intentional, is the interconnection with nature, which has to do with indigenous ways of knowing. And then there's the Anthropocene and health, movement building and systems change, equity and uh, social justice, and systems thinking and complexity. And they are all interdependent and interconnected. And it took us um, approximately 17 months to work on developing this uh, particular framework. And so I think it's important to just highlight uh, that this is not, um, this particular thing is like, what is this framework? And, and the really important piece that I wanted to explain that this is not prescriptive and this is something that is now being used in many parts of the world um, and uh, increasingly in Canada. So I'm asked to speak about this quite a bit uh, lately here, uh, particularly in the province of British Columbia for our nursing uh, programs, but it's now broadening out. So it's a dynamic um, interpretation of planetary health. It gives some foundational language that can be used for um, educators. It's based on a constructivist approach, which is transformational. Um, it's a planning uh, tool that can be used by institutions, and it recognizes diverse learning pathways. So it's not thematic areas. It's made of domains. It's not competencies, which we've seen with other types of climate change toolkits, global health toolkits, which I've been involved in many of them, and a definitive static statement um, that is not, it's not the end. 
So the first one is the interconnection with nature. And I might uh, stress that Dr. Nicole Redfors, Associate uh, Professor at uh, Western University, she's an Indigenous scholar. I've worked with her quite a bit, and she is a leader in ecological Indigenous determinants of health. So if you've looked at any of her work, she is one of the main contributors to the center of this particular um, framework that we've come up with. And so it's called interconnection with nature, and it's understanding our role within nature um, as a species and as an individual, which is foundational to planetary health science and practice. And there's this increasing evidence, as we know, of the interdependence with the biosphere. I've talked about some of those catastrophic events. Our civilization perspectives and consequential attitudes um, have not kept up and evolved accordingly. The false sense of separation between humans and nature perpetuates a deceptive culture of domination over nature, inducing many current environmental crises. Continuing that, it's, um, it's centered on similar frameworks, and, and sometimes we, uh, I'm meeting with uh, Dr. Redfors uh, later this week on another project, and, you know, for some of us who have been teaching the ecological determinants of health, which I have for several years, some of this work, you'll, you'll see some, some overlap in terms of some of the other fields that you might have been a part of in terms of environmental education, sustainability science, and there's this whole thing, human nature connectedness. And that's a real um, pivotal piece of this particular domain. And um, this interconnection is an indicator for mutualism, reciprocity, and symbiosis. And it's this within to denote that humans are part of and not separate from nature. And we define the word nature as encapsulating earth and life, including humans. I really appreciate this particular slide. Um, this is... In, in this one, and, and certainly have some other thoughts about it uh, as well, but it's moving away from that anthropocentric um, where uh, humankind is central and most important beyond the elements, especially of God and, and or other um, living beings. And then we've got the cosmocentricism, which is the eco, the we. And so when we look at that, this plays a higher emphasis on uh, nature, and you can see where it includes um, a lot of uh, uh, play, interplay with others in the world. This comes from uh, her work, and um, she talks about the earth-centered uh, jurisprudence. And what you see here, she talks about the natural laws and the indigenous traditional knowledges and how they then um, have application for planetary health for healthy communities and ecosystems. So looking at this uh, dissonance between being in nature that surrounds us and being of nature. Then moving on to the next um, is the Anthropocene and human-caused um, uh, <laughs> what we do to the, the earth, earth as humans. So um, in this particular uh, a diagram you'll see. It depicts the, uh, the presence of nine planetary boundaries. These are very important because they regulate the Earth's uh, stability and resilience. And the emphasis here is, um, is that humanity operates within the boundaries of each of these processes and, and as we continue to develop and thrive as a generation. Um, there are nine boundaries, but I'm specifically going to point to, if you look up here at the... Um, uh, okay, the, okay, the, uh, at the top, the biosphere integrity and the biogeochemical at the, at the bottom there of your screen. If you look at the legend, you can see the darker the color, it's beyond the zone of uncertainty and which is at high risk. And if you look there at climate change, um, it's currently quantified in the zone of uncertainty, although we do hear a lot about that. But these are other boundaries that are also just as important. And under the biosphere integrity, it indicates uh, chemicals such as organic pollutants, radioactive materials, microplastics uh, that are anthropogenic 
and um, resulting from the influence of human on nature. And they contribute to this high risk. And one of my colleagues here is going to be uh, touching on more of that in their particular presentation. So when we look at the Anthropocene, it's a geologic period of time in which dominant forces shape the Earth's biophysical condition. Um, which is human activity. And we see these massive disruptions in the Earth systems that have, um, that interfere with our particular ecosystems. And then we have what is called the Great Celera um, Acceleration. And so within the past 400 years, the increasing impacts on the planet have been associated with what we call the Great Acceleration. So, um, since World War II, there has been a rapid rate of human activities that have re resulted in significant environmental changes that have threatened the biosphere and um, humans themselves. So in this particular uh, diagram, you can see the me this measures the consumption over time, which shows the dramatic increase since 1950. So you can see here that some of the anthropogenic changes that if you look at how much we've you know increased in terms of our fertilizer consumption, our plastic production since 1950, um, and uh, primary energy use, paper production. As stated by Myers and Frumpkin, they are both uh, medical physicians and experts in the area of planetary health and have written two of the seminal books for planetary health that uh, just recently in the last couple of years, they say planetary health focuses on understanding and the importance of quantifying human health impacts of what they call the environmental disruptions and on developing solutions that will sort through and allow humanity and the natural systems in which it depends on to thrive. And there's a picture of um, uh, Sam Meyer's book there. And then in this one, it's just another one of the metric of the human impacts on the Earth's natural systems resulting in, you know, um, a tropical deforestation, increase in carbon dioxide, and steep gradual increase in biodiversity. So what do we need? We need systems thinking. And if you look at this, this is a schematic uh, uh, diagram that is uh, one that I use often and, and so do my other scholars in showing what we see the underlying causes, the ecological drivers which I've spoken about, then what are some of those proximate causes that we see in the air quality, what are some of the mediating factors that we need to look at and in terms of governance, and what are those health effects that we see, malnutrition, infectious disease, um, uh, displacement. And interestingly enough, in my practice as a nurse, I would often wonder when I would have patients come in and, and little children were, you know, suffering from asthma and different things. And this was 20 years ago that I worked with um, a physician at the time in an environmental uh, clinic in Edmonton. And um, she was one of the first people that really sort of struck me to think, what, what's happening in this environment that is affecting the ill health of those children that she takes care, that she was uh, seeing in her clinic. And so um, I won't go into all the details here, but you can see here there's, I've selected some anthropogenic changes and their multidimensional health impacts. So for example, if we see the way land use changes, that is going to have an effect on our food insecurity and security. So this summarizes many of those effects. And so it's really important to make note of those anthropogenic effects that are connected to our health outcomes, um, use a social and ecological approach uh, that we see in health promotion and disease prevention. And this is related to the uh, determinants of health in animals and ecosystems and focuses on the understanding of the mediating factors and enhance of uh, the lessened outcomes. In terms of systems thinking, and um, this is something that uh, our colleagues, we, we spent a lot of time working on this and really going to, uh, I've listed here, epistemological diversity and humility. Then when we think about how th these complex problems, global health and planetary challenges that we're seeing, that the way to solve these problems do not occur in isolation. They are in relationship to others. So there has to be this... Um, issues of transdisciplinary 
de- that we have. There's always this in- uncertainty, implicit and explicit bias and self-awareness and unintended and unexpected consequences. And then looking at the scale, depending on geographically where you're looking around the world, whether at a micro, meso, macro level, temporal level, and whether it's urgent or elective. And so within this sort of system archetype that I'm talking about, uh, there are particular leverage points, places and methods that are most effective in resolving these issues. And um, the most impact, effective place is to act uh, in a, a systems approach. The domain equity and social justice is one that I, it's dear to my heart because I spent a lot of time on this particular domain myself in writing it. So it focuses on, of course, equity and justice in planetary health, which is founded on the rights of humans and nature. And it's realizing that eliminate, eliminating these systemic barriers, uh, disparities, so that no population care is disproportionate um, burdens is really important as we move on this work. And I might just mention uh, Dr. Farron Gutzman. Uh, he and I co-authored the Global Health Competencies uh, together, and Dr. Teddy Potter is a nurse first nurse for planetary health and planetary health, and she worked alongside me on this document as well. So the inequities and justices worsen planetary health. And some of them I wanted to mention, I can't spend a lot of time, but environmental racism, so that's any uh, policy or practice or directive that disadvantages individuals, groups of particular colors or race. We also talk about frontline communities. You'll hear that. They're the first to often experience the climate crisis. Then there's our fence line communities. And we have some great scholars in Canada that are looking at uh, this work where industrial toxic environments Groups are living closer to those, and we know um, the associated harm that happens with those people that are living close to uh, various toxic uh, factories. And um, multi-species justice, that expands the idea and practice of justice to encompass and respond to the destruction of, of multi-species ways of life and rejects the idea of uh, human exceptionalism. Uh, this is what we call the Just Transition Framework, and in a nutshell, we have what we call this extractive uh, economy, and this is where uh, we're, we're dependent. As you know, extracting all these natural resources that we have, um, in examples of oil, gas, mining, etc., and we know that that type of of extractive economy cannot sustain itself. And then we want to move to what we call the regenerative economy. And this is where we're uh, looking for uh, the principles of eliminate waste and pollution, um, circulate uh, our products and materials, and look at regenerating nature. And so that's, um, uh, in a nutshell, what that is. And then we've got movement building. So it is a movement. We talk about planetary health as being a movement, and this is something that you'll hear for us and the scholars that that, that this is something that we're, we're moving and we need to look at solving the urgent planetary health crisis. So in order to have, what do you need to be able to move along for this movement? You need to put solutions must be put into action. And so that's that San Sao Paulo Declaration requires inclusive relationships, and those relationships include working alongside our faith communities, and I've got a slide that will show that, working alongside our indigenous communities, working alongside our students, our colleagues, and all our uh, disciplines. We have to have thoughtful strategies, and we are working on some of those at this time uh, with that group I'm working with, effective communication, and these transformational partnerships. So the, the great transition will require, and you can see here on the left, so I've, I've taken this from our Planetary uh, Health Alliance uh, work that we have, and it, what you see here is the importance of um, looking at how can we be innovative with our food systems and agriculture, land use and conservation, healthcare and biotechnology, uh, business and economics, and I have a really good friend at the moment, she is... Um, uh, in, uh, actually in England, it, studying that as we, as we, uh, as I do this, this, uh, presentation, uh, the business and economics of planetary health. And so this collaboration across social sectors, and you can see there the natural sciences, uh, health sciences, our faith leaders, 
uh, indigenous communities and others, arts and humanities. We need all of us to work together towards this. So in, in conclusion, I'm hopeful that with the increasing attention to the interconnectedness of human societies in the biosphere by our students, our colleagues, our citizens, and global organizations, that collective actions will be taken up by many to address the complex global planetary challenges, of which I've only mentioned a few, that will be answered by one discipline alone, but require an interdisciplinary and intersectorial approach. In addition, I share with others in the planetary health field the importance for planetary stewards, which are movement builders that recognize the interdependent and intertwined reality of the societal and natural systems that surround us. Planetary stewards work toward environmental and societal justice, which seeks the necessary structural changes to support the achievement of global equity. In the words of Catherine Hayhoe, Christian climate scientist, and I quote her, and this is a recent quote from her, I believe that we are all called to care for each other and for the planet, and to seek, and to seek this, we must do this together. And what she's calling for, to be hopeful, is that we all take action. And in fact, those are the words that she actually said. Um, actually last week. So if any of you are following her. And then um, in conclusion, I started talking about Antonio Guerrero's United Nations director. And he recently has come out and said that we need to immediately hit the fast forward button on net zero deadlines to get to the global network, net zero by 250. Some countries are already on their way, so I am hopeful. Some people ask me when I give this this talk and variations of it, do you have hope? Yes, I do have hope, because we are acting as others are acting in this field. And so um, I want to leave you with this is a beautiful picture that uh, my husband actually took in January of this year. You won't believe it. It wasn't raining in Tofino. And it was um, just before we were finishing. That, by the way, is not him surfing. Uh, he would like to think that is. Um, and so it just, again, reminded me of God's beautiful creation and what we have there and what we want to preserve for the next generation. So I passionately believe, and my students know this and colleagues, in the importance of working alongside my students, colleagues, and partners in order that we learn together, evolve, and move forward in achieving health equity in global health and the emerging field of planetary health. I think it's imperative that we have a shared understanding of the indispensable interconnectedness of human health to the health of the planet and all species. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob, for an amazing talk. Uh, it made me realize some of the connectedness we have, and maybe sometime we should sit down and talk about future things. All right, so um, uh, as far as the evening is concerned, I just want to say thank you for some of my students. I see you out in the audience there. Uh, my wife for coming out, so thank you. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to, to be able to, to present. Thank you, Dave. Um, so you'll see there uh, the title of my talk, rather uh, long talk uh, title there, is, is based on the funding that we get from um, the supporting structures uh, funding and so on. It's, it's called Rerouting Plastics Destined for Landfills uh, and Oceans Towards the Production of Shape Carbons for Use in Composites and, uh, to Prevent Pipe Corrosion. Uh, there's, a bigger, there's a bigger idea behind that, and obviously the reason why we've chosen plastics is because of the huge impact that it has on the environment. So uh, just to give you a sense of who it is that is working on this project, uh, the main uh, or the principal investigators are myself, uh, Dr. In Onyango, and a, a collaborator and friend and brother in, in Christ, uh, Dr. Jacob Mutu at the University of, of Regina. You can see there are the, the funders that have contributed towards this. And uh, last summer, we actually had a MyTech student also working on, on some of this work. So quickly, the outline of this talk was just to talk a little bit about the plastics um, and uh, where, where do they mostly come from, what effect they're actually having on our environment, 
Uh, I don't want to dwell on that too much because I know it can uh, it can be a downer. And the last thing I want to do in the evening is is uh, send us away thinking, oh my word, what did he do? Um, and then uh, something about the remediation. So what are we doing about re- remediating this problem uh, globally? And then what are we doing here at Trinity uh, to try and re- remediate that? I want to give a bit of a summary of, of the research that um, uh, I've been doing and then collaboratively, uh, collaboratively with uh, Dr. Nyango and then just give you some, uh, some, some, uh, some results and thanks and, and acknowledgement. Right, so the first one we want to know is, okay, well, where do, where do all these plastics come from? And until recently, um, if, you, if you looked at the, uh, the stats, you'll see that about 98% of the plastics that we use on an everyday basis which is mostly single-use plastics, uh, either come from crude oil or natural gas. And the way that we, we do that is uh, we, we use catalysts to break uh, that down, uh, break it into uh, particles that we can actually use, monomers, and then we polymerize those. We put them into long chains, uh, and we go, yay, we got something we can use. And this is, this is good. Uh, of course, it's been very useful for us uh, from containing things, uh, storing stuff, and so on. Um, but it, it, has, it has its shelf life. And so what, what you have to do then is try to figure out how do you actually use this material that you've now used once and you've got no, no further purpose for. Well, we tend to try and recycle them. And our focus on recycling generally, but not always, is on the plastics that can be melted and then reformed because uh, the other ones are a little bit more tricky to deal with. Uh, and so what do you do with them? I'm going to get a look at those now. So these are the categories of, of things, and a lot of them fall into the single-use plastic. So you you uh, go out for dinner, and you, ha- you have a meal, and you go, oh, well, I haven't finished everything, so can I have a dish? So they give you a dish, and you usually use that once, take it home, eh, don't use it again, it goes into the bin. Um, so what do you do with that material? So what are the problems that have arisen from this plastic waste that we're, that we're generating? And you can see some of the images there on the screen. And uh, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch comes to mind. And immediately you go, like, oh, my word, are we doing that? Yes, we're doing that. Um, and so with this rapid increase of plastic use, you, you now have a problem of, okay, so what do you do with it when you're finished? Um, it served its purpose. Now what do we do with it? And a, a lot of it, uh, we think, well, we're recycling. We're actually not recycling a lot. And you'll actually see in Canada about 9%, 9% is recycled. The rest of it goes into, the, into uh, either incineration or it goes into landfill. And if it goes into landfill, it's most likely going to be washed away into, from the ground into groundwater or to the sea. And so that's, where it's, that's why we have garbage patches in the middle of the ocean. Um, so with fossil fuels, one of the things we realize is it's not just that we use the fossil fuel to make plastics. Yeah, we, we're doing that. We are doing that. But in addition to doing that, so we, we're taking oil that we could have used for energy, assuming that's what we wanted to do in the first place. And I know Tim, I heard Tim's uh, talk the last time around and saying this uh, experiment with burning things has come to an end, uh, but we still want to burn things. Um, so, um, and, and you know, just go to your normal campfire, and you'll notice we like to burn things. Um, so four, four to eight percent of the global oil consumption goes to plastics. Okay, so that's not too bad if you think about it. Uh, but w- the, the next part of the problem is not only are we using oil to make plastics, but we're also using oil to burn to have energy to make plastics. Okay, so then then you have another problem, and with that comes a greenhouse gas carbon dioxide. So you're producing this large amount of carbon dioxide to make a product that you use once or maybe a few times, and then you throw away. Um, And then, of course, the the next part of that is, okay, well, I can't, I don't know what to do with that. So what we do is we incinerate it. And when we incinerate it, we generate more carbon dioxide. So this fossil fuel that we had, a limited resource of, we take, we make a plastic, uh, we burn to make the plastic, then we burn the plastic. Okay, so the logic behind that is obviously very flawed. Um, the next thing is obviously then if you, if you want to know how to get rid of it, well, if we don't burn it, we put it in the ground. If we can't see it, it's not there, right? 
And, and so you can see uh, huge patches and you could find areas all around the world. Uh, and this is scary. You have people who go to these dumps and actually take food from these dumps. Um, and so of the six to nine billion tons of, of plastic, about five billion tons of that have either gone to landfill or have leaked from landfill into water systems. And that's, that's scary. So the problems with that are, firstly, even if you put it in the ground, okay, yeah, we can't see it, it takes forever to decompose because organisms are not uh, designed for that process. And so, for example, uh, your, your, your normal uh, water bottle, your drinking pot bottle, which is made of polyethylene terephthalate, excuse my uh, tripping over words, 450 years to, de to actually degrade. All right, so you have this problem of, okay, it's not degrading, but when it does start to break down, and that's through sunlight and normal erosion processes, then it starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller, but it's still, it, most plastics are not actually uh, breaking down into uh, to other products. Um, so now those plastics themselves are actually affecting the organisms in the soil. And uh, studies have indicated that there are species that are losing fertility, things like mites and larvae and so on. And these all have health uh, aspects because they're part of the soil, they're part of the way that we have our cycle of growing stuff in the soil. So if they're under threat, what we grow in the soil will also be under threat. The other thing about microplastics is that they're, they're because they're getting smaller and smaller, they're going into the nano level. Now, if micro is bad, nano is 10 times worse. And nano can cross the blood-brain barrier. And so they've started to discover there are all sorts of things that are happening uh, in, in human health, uh, where plastics are actually getting into the blood system. And uh, that's, of course, not good. And um, some of the things that some of the plastics do is if they, don't, if they don't break down into smaller parts and themselves not being too bad, but they're still now small and being ingested by organisms, some of them actually do break down into toxic compounds. And those compounds are carcinogenic. Uh, and, and, and so when they also affect our immune system. So uh, uh, as my students know, I would say bad juju, very bad, not good. All right, so um, the next thing, of course, is now if it gets into the water systems, um, it's getting into the, into the marine ecosystems. Now you have, you have this huge problem of, uh, of dumping and trying to get rid of stuff because we don't know what to do with it. So we just put it in the ground or we'll find some place that seems open and uh, inviting and we get rid of stuff there. Um, so we're looking at 14 million tons of plastic entering the sea. There, there are some places on, on this planet where you actually cannot see rivers. You just see floating garbage, plastic. Uh, the Great Pacific Barrier uh, patches there is, is an example. And you can see. Uh, organisms trying to feed and taking this in, and and so that's obviously uh, a huge problem. So um, this is obviously going to affect our marine systems and talk about global health. Yeah. Um, so what is actually being done? Because when you look at that, you go, "Oh my word!" That you know, this is you, you're giving us a data. What's what's happening? Right. So. Um, Okay, uh, we're, we are recycling, and we do our bit. Uh, for those of you in church who think you're doing your good deed and you put your, your cup inside the blue bin, uh, the blue bin gets thrown away with the other bin in the trash. It doesn't actually get recycled. I'm sorry to tell you that. Um, so about 9% of that is, is actually recycled. So what are we doing? We're going, well, can we find other ways of making plastics? And the answer is yes. Uh, we are starting to do that because there's an imperative to do that. We're starting to realize you just can't continue this way. So uh, hemp, as an example, as long as you don't smoke it, that's good. Um, elephant grass, uh, cellulose, uh, we're using algae, uh, we're using fungi and so on, fungi. Um, and, of course, we're trying to figure out a circular economy. If once we design it, we're trying to figure out, is there a way of stopping it to get to the landfill? Can we not figure out how to repurpose that? Instead of looking at that as waste, how about looking at that as a resource? So that's another way of looking at it. Um, we've also started to figure out that there are other organisms that actually produce products that we have, which we normally throw away. So fish scales, for example, 
um, you can start using those as plastics for wrappings and so on, and they are biodegradable. So we don't have to have the, the glad wrap, cling wrap, uh, styrofoam kind of things that we're using. We found that there are ways to use enzymes to actually break down some of these plastics. So that's good. We're getting, we're going in the right direction. We've even found, uh, bugs, wiggly worms, as you can see over there. They actually, that is uh, polystyrene and they, they, they actually grow off polystyrene. They'll eat it. They like it. Um, so we now are starting to figure out, yep. We might be able to find a way of being able to get rid of some of this stuff. We can, we are also finding ways of depolymerizing po polymers to go back to monomer. So we can then start this whole process again, circular economy. And then the other is we also starting to look at, um, plant based, uh, 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 plastics and figure out, okay, there are problems with these, of course, because some of these plastics don't degrade in a normal compost heap. They actually require very special conditions. And if they get back into the water system, we go, well, it's biodegradable. Yes, it is biodegradable in the right conditions. But in the sea where the temperature is cold, they behave like normal plastics. And so you've actually done no good. You're just as bad as you were before. So what are we doing in our project? You go, well, uh, are you using plastics? Well, we're trying to. Uh, we're trying to address this, this problem that relates again to health. Uh, and that's about water. And, uh, water, water pipes, uh, getting contaminated with, with, uh, with, uh, rust and also with bioorganisms. And so what you find is that with the pipes that rust, not only does water and air cause the rust, but we found that bioorganisms can live together in a community call, call, uh, forming a biofilm. And the biofilm together with the other chemicals that are there can actually eat away at the pipe, corrode the pipe, and then, of course, burst the pipe. So, um, you can see there's a whole process of how this happens. And you can protect the pipe as much as you like. It's still going to happen. It will happen faster or slower if this is the way that you, you do, uh, with the, with the pipe. So why should we study this? The first thing is Christians, of course. Um, we realize that we're, we're being stewards because, uh, the disruption, the lack of water supply when that does happen is, is ghastly, right? So we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, and the other is if you just if you just simply looked at it from a financial point of view, uh, last year they they reckon 2.5 trillion US dollars was spent on on water pipes that had corroded and uh, burst mains, right? So no water supply. Okay, so uh, there's a reason to do it. So how can you stop water pipes from bursting? Well, one way of doing that is to introduce a pipe within the pipe. And the pipe within the pipe could be something that is plastic. Uh, and one thing that you could do, so it's a pipe liner. So one thing you can do is think about, can you make the pipe liner from recycled plastic? We have no other purpose for it. Okay, well, why can't you find a more uh, applicable uh, reason to use it? So that's the first one. And then when you do that, can you make that plastic so that it is also antimicrobial, so that it stops the biofilm former, formers on the pipe and stops the corrosion. Is that possible? So composites using uh, pl those plastics and other kinds of metal oxide and metals uh, are likely to be able to do that. So they, they show a, pot a potential for doing that. So the strategies that we've employed uh, to try and look at making these liners uh, in conjunction with our collaborator in Saskatchewan um, is to choose a reaction type, which is quite common. Uh, it's not too difficult to, to do. And, and usually this requires some kind of metal uh, in the presence of a carbonate ion, and it forms a metal carbonate. Uh, carbon dioxide, when it dissolves in water, will produce carbonic acid, which produces carbonate. Ta -da, you have the carbonate you want. So what we want to do is try and see if we can do this by, by shaping things without using very toxic chemicals, or by shaping them using non-toxic chemicals. So let it do it by itself or guide it along its way. Once, once that happens, we heat it up, we produce the metal oxide. You can see there is an inherent problem there, though, because you've now driven off carbon dioxide. So yay, we have actually made the problem a little bit worse. But we can actually make metal oxide directly, and that is the next step of what we are going to be doing. And then once you do that, if you coat the, the, the metal oxide that you have with the carbon, which you got from a waste plastic, which would have been thrown away anyway, um, you can then use that 
uh, to make the structure you want. Now, sometimes we do want the shaping agent because the thing won't form the way we want it. And the way we want it is the, is the, is the way that it, be, it, it will behave the best. And so sometimes we have to guide it along. I want it to be a soccer ball shape and it, it wants to be a square. I, like, no, I want a soccer ball. So what you've got to do is you have to coax it. And usually we use horrible chemicals to do that. So what we've decided to do is to try make that process green. So the, mater the materials that we, the metals that we've used, uh, we've tried to look at them from a point of being uh, antimicrobial. Can it do more than one function? Uh, can it, can it uh, capture carbon dioxide, for example? And can it be used for energy? So it might be able to solve more than one problem simultaneously. And so the metals we've chosen are zinc and manganese, magnesium, uh, and, and iron. We've just recently started some work with a thesis student on magnesium and getting some nice promising results. Magnesium is not toxic to the environment, can easily be shaped to what we want, and is dirt cheap. So it looks like it's a promising candidate for what we want to do. And we focused, uh, I know, I know uh, Dave, you talked about nano. Uh, we focused our attention primarily on micro for now. I know Dr. Nyanga would say, give me nano. Um, we will do that. But we can't, we don't have the equipment right now to be able to see the nano. And so that's very specialized. So what we can see we are making so that in the long run, we'll be able to then scale down and do what we need to do. The techniques we've used are using non-toxic chemicals and shaping agents. So amino acids, hey, they're out in the environment anyway. Um, and so we're using those to actually guide and direct the shapes of the things we want. We're using less energy, and you'll see that just now in what we've done. And we're trying to consume some of the waste plastic. So uh, during the summer... We actually used the uh, the Keurig cups. Um, we, we stored so many Keurig cups at the end. Michaela was saying, "Stop giving me uh, uh, the uh, stop it. We we got too many." So we stopped recycling. So then there's a big sign in the in the in our staff room, our tea room, saying, "We are no longer collecting." So anyway, I'm sure there was a collective sigh of relief when we stopped. Um, so what are we doing and how are we doing it? Uh, well, we do t traditional methods either by boiling things up or we put it in an oven and uh, this is a nice green uh, way of doing things. It goes into this Teflon, the white container over there, goes into the container. Uh, you just mix the chemicals, you close the thing, you put it in the oven, you come back the next day, da -da, it's made what you want. It's, it's really simple. Um, uh, because it heats up, it actually gets very pressurized, but the temperature is 160, somewhere around there. So it's, it's not a huge drain on, on energy, um, and the products are relatively easy to, to get rid of. Uh, we also use a furnace to be able to generate the carbon that will coat those things. Um, and then the way we look at them through is optical microscopy, and uh, we have infrared spectroscopy for those of the chemists in the in the group here. Right. So we, we say, oh, how do you know you've made this? Because all you look at it, you go, yeah, it's a white powder. How do you know you've made what you said? Well, we go and look at it and go figure out what we've made. And so the, the, the step after this, and this is where Dr. Nyanga is going to come in just now, and she'll maybe mention some of this. Not, no, yes, maybe, not sure, a little bit. Okay. Um, is we then tested the stuff. We said, okay, well, we've made it. D does it do what we think it's going to do? And, um, so the first thing we did was we looked at zinc and zinc oxide. And you can see these different forms. We we're actually using this one. Uh, so, okay, that's the hexagonal word site that we we're, we're actually using. And um, so Michaela actually made this in the laboratory. I don't know if you can actually see those, but they're they're actually hexagonal in shape. They're uh, they're about 1.5 microns in size. They're hexagonal. We used arginine to actually make some amino acid to do this, uh, and uh, relatively low temperature to do that. Um, what we discovered was they they look kind of flowery when you when you zoom in on them. We do not have an electron microscope, so we can't zoom in sufficiently to tell you exactly what that does. But that's the biggest we can get uh, to actually show you what it is. And uh, uh, the papers sort of kind of indicate that that might be something like that. So th those are seen by electron micro microscopes. Um, and they also look sideways like they're jellyfish. So they, they look like they uh, are hexagonal from one side and jellyfish from another. But the, the nice thing about them is that we have actually tried them out. So uh, in the microbiology lab, um, we actually tried that out. So Harrison's in the, in the audience over here, and he's tried this out uh, using the Kobe Bauer uh, disk diffusion test. And what we discovered was, uh, lo and behold, they actually do work. They're, at this stage, they're still big particles. They, we can get them smaller, but they are, in fact, inhibiting the growth of bacteria. And so that, that's good. 
unfortunately, it does seem that when you coat them with carbon, their activity is slightly less. But uh, if you were going to put them into a plastic, uh, like dissolves like. So carbon with carbon makes sense. So even if we do reduce some of the activity, it's easier to trap it inside a plastic than to, to trap the zinc oxide by itself. It doesn't want to do that. It will clump together. Uh, then we've made other things. So um, Michaela is a wizard this. Uh, these are uh, what we call uh, urchins, and so she's made some of those. Uh, we haven't tested those out in uh, microbiology. Nod your head, shake your head there. Thank you, uh, Harrison. We've tested this. We've not. We've tested this. Good. We have tested this, people. Um, we, we don't know yet. Um, yeah, we're still doing a lot of uh, pre uh, preliminary work to try and figure out what works, what doesn't work, and so on. And then manganese, uh, Jack uh, actually made some of these uh, very nice spherical manganese uh, two oxide particles. Uh, also a wizard doing this. Uh, and he made cubes. These are amazing little micro cubes. Uh, we haven't fully tested these to see whether they're, uh, they're active against uh, um, bacteria at this stage. But we will, it's one of the things we'll have a look at. So conclusions in some of the future work. Uh, well, we've, we've shown that we can do this by a green method, which is good. So we're going in the right direction. We don't want to pump uh, lots of toxic chemicals down the drain. So we can, we've shown we can do this. We've shown that uh, once you do it, you can um, make a whole range of different things. We don't always know at this stage how each of them behave. We're still learning that. We'll figure that out later on. Um, we sh we've found that if you heat them up and coat them with carbon, they keep their shape. That's good. So they're good templates to make the things we want. Um, and we've also so shown for the moment in, the, in our preliminary studies, which uh, Harrison is going to be presenting on in uh, Houston, Texas, at some stage in, what's it, June? June? Yeah. Um, that the hexagonal disks actually do work. And uh, we're trying to figure out uh, what else do they work with? So we have a number of other organisms we're going to test and see how that works. And the next step after that will be to start putting these materials that we now know work into polymers and testing those out in a real environment with, uh, with, with water. So uh, in terms of the project itself, just to, uh, to give some acknowledgments, uh, there's the team. The team was uh, the, the team in, in summer. Uh, I'm, I'm the tall, uh, bald one, if you're trying to figure out where I am in the team. Um, and uh, Maria is on the right-hand side. Maria came from uh, Colombia uh, and uh, uh, joined us. Um, hopefully, she's going to be working in Toronto. Uh, one of her uh, future supervisors contacted me to say, is she any good? And I said, double thumbs up. Um, so hopefully, she's going to be doing that. Uh, the funders uh, and so on. Uh, and obviously, University of Regina for allowing me to go there, allowing Jack to go there and to work alongside with one, uh, one another. He didn't have to. Um, Jacob's just that kind of guy. Uh, yeah, sure, whatever. Come on over. Um, that's that's how he is. Uh, very magnanimous. The chemistry department. So I say thank you for allowing me to do the research I've done. Biology uh, for all their help and collaboration uh, with uh, Dr. Nyango. Thank you, um, and all your expertise that you've injected into the project. The research office. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, my wife is in the audience. Thank you. And last but not least, my Lord and my Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, my Messiah. Thank you. So thank you for coming out tonight. Thank you to Dr. Assel and Dr. Durbach for setting the stage so beautifully for my talk. I am going to be talking about microbes and planet health. And if you do not know that microbes do influence planet health, uh, the past three years of the pandemic should be a very stark <laughs> eye opener. Um, but for those who have this, I know that some of my students from microbiology, so this is sort of like a refresher for you. But for those who do not know, uh, we are going to be, uh, I'm just going to be giving you a, a background of my, what microbes are and then some of the issues that we face with them. So uh, the microbial world, just as the name suggests, they are invisible, but they are quite ubiquitous in the environment. So the chair you're sitting on, the hair on your head, your fingers, every single place that you can actually think of, there is going to be microbes. All right. So they're ubiquitous in the environment, populating ev almost every niche on planet Earth. And obviously, because of that, they have an impact on today's global economy. 
These are the members of the microbial world. So you can uh, identify some of those, you know, obviously with the SARS-CoV-2 that caused COVID-19. Those are our viruses, bacteria, um, protists, fungi, virions, satellites, prions, etc. So they do have lots of influence. And I know most of us, when we think of microbes, at least some of us, when we think of microbes, we think of them from a negative perspective, hence pandemic. However, they do more than just cause disease, right? So they are producers of important compounds. Um, so like, for example, our enzymes that we use to catalyze biochemical reactions, they also produce our antimicrobials, so things like medications, so and you know of antibiotics, antifungals, antiparasitics, those things things. They produce those uh, that we use in uh, clinical interventions, but obviously they are pathogenic because we are, we are also using those to, to treat for the very pathogens that uh, some of them actually produce on our anti antimicrobials. They are involved in biogeochemical engines and the biogeochemical, biogeochemical engines of the earth. So they're involved in things like carbon cycling, and nutrient, uh, nitrate fi nitrogen fixation, but they are also huge contributors to the uh, greenhouse gases. And some of them are actually uh, uh, said to be more potent than carbon dioxide that we think of when we think of greenhouse gases. But our microbes also purify the Earth's water systems, right? So uh, we all drink water. I've noticed most of you have water bottles. Dr. Darbak has been talking about the plastics. We know when we use one, uh, plastics for one time, use plastics with water, uh, water bottles. They purify the Earth's water systems, but they are also the major, some of the major contri uh, contaminants of that resource. But they are not obviously doing this on their own. We are helping them along by polluting some of those waterways by ourselves. They're also involved in bioremediation activities, um, a range of uh, uh, different uh, pollutants in the environment. We then bring our, our microbes to come and save the day. So, for example, things like oil spills, um, our plastics, some of our um, microbes are actually involved in degrading plastics. So we should be talking about that as well. Um, and many other pollutants in the air, they are, there, they are brought in to help with bioremediation. They are also helpful in protecting some of our crops from destructive pests and pathogens that cause crop diseases. But some of them have also been used, uh, bioengineered in what we call green technology, green biotechnology, to help improve crop yields and provide nutritional crops. So to help in mal in places where there's malnutrition due to uh, poor nutritional nutrition of crops, so then our uh, cro uh, microbes are used to improve on those crop yields, and they are also involved in things like synthesizing fuels, uh, things like bioelectricity and biofuels, and many many more. I was just giving you a, a couple so that you can sort of see they are not just causing death; they are they are also to help in the in environmental issues. But there is a lot that we still do not know about our microbial world. So what we are calling microbial dark matter. So we know a very the, the even the with the myriads of my, of microbes that we are involved we are aware of. It's a very small percentage, and this is hampered simply because of lack of technology. But as we're making strides in technological advancements, we are then are discovering the microbial world. So that's the microbial dark matter, and the purpose of all of this is to be able to uncover those hidden potentials for these microbes to help in some of the issues that we face and some of those to give us societal gain. But the health of the planet, as I've said, microbes are everywhere. So the health of the planet, the environment and all its living inhabitants is dependent on the partnerships of with our microbial world, right? So we're going to be looking at some of those interactions. One of the ones that I work um, with or my, my research is antimicrobial resistance. And antimicrobial resistance is simply the ineffectiveness of an antimicrobial, so our antibiotic, our antifungal, etc., against a known pathogen or against a, a microbe. And antimicrobial resistance, it's a natural phenomenon, meaning it is we are not the ones who are generating antimicrobial resistance. We are making it worse, yes, but it's a natural phenomenon, meaning our microbe groups have this innate ability to have or, or have these mechanisms to be able to protect themselves out in the natural world against other competitors in the environment. Right. However, since we have introduced some of these antimicrobials into clinical settings, we have exacerbated that situation 
situation over the past eight decades due to our misuse and overuse. What I mean like misuse is, for example, if you pester your doctor, give me an antibiotic for something that the antibiotic is not going to cure, for example, a viral infection, or then if they do give you an antibiotic for an, uh, for an infection, you feel better after two days and then you decide, I'm not going to take the rest of it, so it stays in your in your uh, drawer. So you are helping the microbes or the pathogens that you had to develop resistance. Then someone else, your friend comes along and says, yeah, I have this sort of infection. He said, oh yeah, I had the same thing. Here's what was left over. These are things that actually happen where people share medications. And therefore, because you did not finish your medication, your friend has not gotten the full dose. They are then also helping antimicrobial resistance along. And then overuse would be things like where they're used in uh, agricultural settings, for example, to help uh, promote growth for food cro food animals, for example, or where they use prophylactically just to help pre prevent those infections that, um, but they're used overly, right? So that is what that overuse means. And this is now a dire problem in that the WHO has termed a global public health threat, and we are going to look at some uh, statistics a bit later on. And there's priority pathogens that ha now have now been flagged, um, that those are the ones that with most clinical and economical impact. So clinical where none of our anti antibiotics, specifically for bacteria, are effective anymore against the class, the, the, these pathogens. And obviously with that comes um, raised healthcare associated costs. Antibiotic resistance specifically, so when here, uh, when I started, I said antimicrobial resistance, this is just to cover all our microbe groups, but antibiotic resistance, which is specifically to those that are in our bacteria and some of our fungi, um, in 2019, and I believe this is from World Health Organization, they uh, looked at the economic impact, uh, at the uh, uh, health, Im the impacts of antibiotic resistance, and there's a direct cause causing at least 1.3 million deaths per year, but this number is getting worse every, every single year. And it is projected that anti antibiotic resistance particularly is going to is um, going to get worse, as I mentioned, where we are coming from right now. That, well, 2019 statistics was 1.3 million deaths, but we are looking at by 2050, 10 million deaths per year, right? And this is then said to be more than non-communicable diseases and things like cancers combined. So antimicro antibiotic resistance is going to be one of those issues, a big a, a dire issue uh, f uh, in the years to come if we do not do anything about it and costing the global economy at least $100 trillion per year. Right. And this is sort of another statistic uh, or imagery from a review in 2014 to just to show in terms of global distribution, um, those numbers, so where within the 10 million deaths, so this is sort of where it's the distribution of those deaths. And we can see that the areas, the regions which are going to be the hardest hit would be places where, for example, the infrastructure perhaps is not the best and they are the ones who are going to have the most, um, they're going to have the most mortality. However, this issue is a global situation, so we should not be looking at it and thinking it's not going to really affect us. It's, the numbers are really low in North America. Um, being our brother's keepers, we should also be concerned about the other regions of the world because the fact that they are across the globe does not mean it is not going to come to us with global travel. So just um, to give you sort of an idea of where we are, so this is an antibiotic resistance timeline. So if we look at the left there where we st uh, the beginning of the 1900s the top the top three leading causes of death was infectious disease so this is during the pre-antibiotic era so this is before antibiotics were discovered and i say discovered in quotes meaning from a western perspective because we do know that there's lots of cultures that were already using some of the like plants and um, and uh, soils and molds and things like that with not understanding the uh, the biology behind it but knowing that those something in those products that was actually uh, uh, an, um, remedial, right? So during this pre-antibiotic era, 
there was lots of deaths because of infectious diseases more than those from World War One, for example. But then we fast, we move into the golden age of antibiotics, and this is where most of our antibiotics were discovered. Everyone and every anyone was discovering antibiotics mostly from the soil microbiome. Um, prior to this period, this is where penicillin, which is uh, tribute. Uh, attributed to be the first antibiotic to be uh, formulated, uh, discovered by Alexander Fleming. But then after that, we have the golden age of antibiotics where we have lots of different antibiotics discovered. And at this point, obviously, there's lots of diseases then that were mitigated. A lot of medical procedures were made available because of the introduction of antibiotics. However, now we are at the discovery void, meaning even if we to discover an antibiotic today, it does. It probably would not help simply because it is. It probably will be under the classes that have already been discovered. Meaning, some of the mechanisms that our bacteria have against them have already been identified. Right. So we are at a discovery void, lack of antibiotics. But also, you can see with lack of antibiotics, there we have well, that projected statistic of 20, uh, 2050 with ten million people dying per year from antibiotic resistance, uh, antibiotic resistance. If you notice there, the way it says 2017 as an example, Klebsiella pneumoniae strain is resistant to all commercial antibiotics. And this is not unique to Klebsiella pneumoniae. A lot of our uh, priority pathogens are on that, uh, in that category. And I'm sure the nurses in this room who treat infections will be able to, to appreciate that fact that some of our pathogens are going into that category where there's nothing that is available to be able to stop them. As if that is not enough, let's add climate change to this to the equation. Right. So the impact of climate change on global health has been termed as the single biggest health threat facing humanity. And to at least um, in statistics, they've said uh, the statistics right now, they're saying that at least uh, 250,000 additional deaths per year between 2030 and 2050 due to climate change. Right. That is not um, part of that 10 million number that was given before due to antibiotic resistance. There's been many identified health impacts and the ones I really want to focus on as a microbiologist are the ones that our microbial players are involved in. So you can see they're highlighted things like waterborne diseases and other water related health impacts, zoonosis that we're very much familiar with, SARS-CoV-2, um, ve vector borne diseases. And these are just diseases that are carried by our tick and things like ticks, mosquitoes. And then things like foodborne diseases as well. Right? So these are some of the health impacts that have been identified. And this is statistic, uh, information from WHO's website. Coming back to our microbial group, because we do know that they are everywhere. So the effects of climate change is going to affect them. And this has been the inspiration of many TV shows. I have not watched this one, but I hear Last of Us. I don't know how many people have watched it, how good it is, how... St uh, <laughs> microbiologically uh, accurate it is, I don't know. But anyway, so, but the other one that I've used even in my class to teach would be contagion. And people, when we started watching this, be prior to the pandemic, my students would say, well, this would never happen. This would never happen. And I said, hmm, yeah, just wait and see. And we had literally just finished watching it at the end of 2019. We had literally just finished watching this movie when I was hearing rumblings of this pneumonia-like disease that is uh, coming out of China. And lo and behold, in January, we had a pandemic. But anyway, pathogens in waiting. So climate change is just the, uh, 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 an interesting uh, set of events that is, has, it's like pathogens have just been waiting for this event to show their true colors, right? So as, as global climatic patterns change, these perturbations will influence the health and well-being of all organisms and the environment they inhabit. So not just us, but also the micro, our microbes, uh, microorganisms. And as the most abundant organisms on Earth, the, the contributions, so whether good or bad, are going to be affected by those uh, that change in climatic path, uh, p patterns. Right. So in some of these, the Earth's microbiome, what I mean, the Earth's microbiome. So microbiome, again, is just our microbes and, the, and their genes in the, in the environment will have long lasting effects if nothing, if nothing is done about the situation. 
hospital. We do know for as of now that shifts in temperature, precipitation, humidity, etc., are already affecting some of our microbial populations. So we we have new and emerging pathogenic threats where the, the data is showing that at least 58% of infectious human diseases are likely to worsen with, uh, with uh, climate change. And this is a recent study from last year. Um, that we've also noticed that there's things with in, things like increased vector-borne diseases and zoonotic diseases. And this is because those climate hazards are not only bringing pathogens closer to people. So, for example, with our vector-borne diseases, where we have with uh, warmer temperatures, a lot um, of our insects are getting uh, they have a wider geographical range to sort of play in. So some of the diseases that were maybe unique to certain parts of the world are going to find a wider uh, geographical range. But things like with zoonotic diseases where climatic hazards then are bringing people closer to pathogens, right? So, for example, where when we have uh, heat waves and you decide I'm going to go and jump into the the nearest water body around me, you are taking yourself to a potential, a place where a lot of pathogens, well, potential pathogens are, are um, reside, but because again of these different climatic path, uh, patterns, some of those characteristics are sort of uh, improved and so they can become pathogenic. Going back to my work on antimicrobial resistance, we have also noticed that gl uh, global climatic changing gl uh, climatic patterns are, is already exacerbating AMR. So obviously, if we're going to have all of these indicators of, of disease going up, antimicrobial resistance is going to go up because we already do not have, we have a limited arsenal of uh, antimicrobials that we can use. But when we are adding more priority pathogens to the list, we are not helping the situation. And it is actually said that we are going to see an expansion of those priority pathogens, meaning we do need to have solutions or alternatives in terms of antimicrobial um, chemotherapy, chemotherapies. And this is going to cost, it's estimated to cost the global economy between 2 to $4 billion by 2030. One of the solutions or one of the ways we are trying to tackle this situation is what we are calling One One Health. And this is the idea, it's a sort of like uh, understanding that um, the planetary health is just an interconnectedness and interdependence of uh, human, animal, and environmental health. Right, so we do, we understand human and animal health, right, because we do know of uh, both clinical and veterinary uh, health issues, but environmental health people don't really think much about it, right? But w the environment that we live in as humans and animals is connected by our microbes, right? So in One Health, we are thinking about all of these different niches or these different settings and how to come up with a solution that is not only go is going to sort of traverse all the different settings and sort of solve these issues at a go. Because previously we were thinking from the perspective of if it's a clinical situation, we're thinking, for, let's say, human clinical situation, we're only thinking very limitedly and looking to try and circumvent clinical infections. However, we do know that our microbes gladly traverse these different settings. And when they do do this, they have different lifestyles that they're able, able to adopt. And as they go from setting to setting, changing lifestyles, some of the things they acquire in one setting, they bring to the next setting so in terms of clinical situations, for example, if something is able to live in the environment with different, uh, different characteristics, it can then bring those characteristics into the clinical setting, making those even um, more difficult to resolve. But anyway, One Health is sort of looking at a collaborative situation where we are bringing together people from the different settings sitting down and saying, these are the problems we are seeing in our settings. These are our pathogens in those particular settings. And looking at those different settings and saying, how can we then come up with solutions that are going to be effective? So One Health involves everyone, everyone including you as a listener today. So here we're wanting to come together to collaborate in terms of looking at what the problems are and coming up with solutions, communicating some of those problems and issues like we're doing today, 
m making you aware, for example, of what antimicrobial resistance is and how we can uh, t we can tackle that, and then uh, coming up with solutions and initiatives that we can coordinate and roll out to be able to uh, s solve this situation or help solve this situation. So working together is key to um, rolling out One Health and having it successful. And one of the things that have come has come out of this One Health is antimicrobial stewardship, right? So we do know that One Health approach to combating uh, antimicrobial resistance considers all these sectors in the fight against antimicrobial resistance. Why? When we protect one, we then have the potential to protect all. So when we have solutions against, um, let's say, our priority pathogens in the health setting, because these pathogens traverse the different settings, then some of those solutions will fall, will carry over to the other settings as well. So these coordinated interventions, we want to promote, improve, monitor, and evaluate the, ju the judicious use of our antimicrobials. And what, why is this even important? Well, we want to prolong the shelf life of our current and future chemotherapeutics. You do not want to show up at the hospital and the doctor tell you we cannot treat your cut. We cannot treat your paper cut because there is no antibiotic that is going to be helpful to, to you because you have a resistant um, pathogen. And obviously to reduce the burden of infectious diseases that is uh, plaguing our world. And if you see the antimicrobial stewardship encompasses five R's, one of them is responsibility. And it is not responsibility for someone out there. It's responsibility for you in here. And hopefully you share that the knowledge that you have gained today with others out there and to let them know to be responsible and to be good stewards of some of the, of these products that we have been given. So in closing, I just want to share this verse. Uh, Dr. Clement started off with, <laughs> yes, we are, so doc, uh, we started off with this verse, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness therein. It, where we have been brought alongside, God has brought us alongside him as co-workers in his, in his uh, work to have dominion over the works of his hand. He has given us all these things and he's put them under our feet, but our role is to tend and keep them and not to abuse them. Are you going to join that call? Thank you. Well, thank you very much to all three speakers. Just gave us a lot to think about. And um, we just have a few minutes left, but we want to give the last word to the four panelists. But before that, I will allow just a few minutes for questions to the speakers. So we have one burning question so far. Well, you just um, you just said that the stuff that goes in the blue bin goes in the garbage. Yep. Yeah. Like what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> Can you uh, repeat the question? Uh, so the, the the question was. Um, um, I made a statement that stuff that goes into the blue bin uh, generally just goes straight di directly into the garbage. And I think your response was, what the heck? Um, yeah, it, that is what, yeah, what the heck? Um, and that, that generally does happen. And um, we are recycling a lot less than we think we are. So when we think we're being responsible by putting it in the recycling bin, um, even that which goes into the bin, a lot of that actually lands up in landfill. So I, I know, I know. And, and so there's, uh, in terms of our ability, and I think uh, Tim can actually also help with that, in terms of our ability to recycle certain plastics, even our recycle uh, plants and so on, um, they're not as equipped as we think they are to be able to, to handle those plastics. And why do you have a Keurig? That was what, sorry, why? <laughs> <laughs> why do we have a Keurig? <clears throat> I'm, I'm just going to say, uh, because it's the evening, uh, don't mess with my coffee, okay? So that's, that's, that's all I'm going to say. All right, but, so yeah. any other burning questions here? Sorry, if Tim wants to answer, because I know Tim has some. Well, I was just going to say that um, we're, we're doing work with an organization called the Ocean Legacy Foundation, and um, they, they have collection centers all over the coast of B.C., and uh, they bring a lot of plastic in from ocean plastic and just as an example though they contacted me because we have this plastic shredder machine and um, they had they had 300 boxes because this is our society right this is what we're dealing with is we love our starbucks 
and Starbucks syrups, right, that we pump into our coffees. And they had, uh, they they did a run. So those syrups come in these plastic bottles and they all have a plastic lid. Um, Some of the lids in the particular run were um, defective. So rather than sort of sort through them and find the good ones and the bad ones, they're all garbage. And so they all ended up, fortunately, at Ocean Legacy, 300 cases of like a meter cube of lids that were destined to Starbucks. And they're all garbage. And so they said to us, do you want to grind them for us? Because we, we're working on a way to, to um, blend ocean plastic with this sort of plastic into a second life products. Well, it, like 300 cases. But that's our wasteless, wasteful nature. Uh, yeah, that's, and that's happening all the time. So we need to be very, very conscious of our <clears throat> And the, the, the last part I'll answer to your why do we have a Keurig is things in my ear going la 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 I'm not listening all right so but yeah we, you know we like what we like and whether that's going to be inconvenient or not it's very difficult to change behavior of people it, it really is yeah Laura's just finished describing this the one health initiative uh, earlier on Barb was describing planetary health and they sound very similar I'm wondering how those two things are the answer yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, there is an excellent article written uh, just recently by my colleague, Dr. Farron Gutzman, which I've just brought up. And it's one of the articles that we are referring to for our well-being society group that I'm working with. Um, originally, and, and we, the general thesis of our, our article is One Health originally um, was focused more on zoonosis. And that was not... Um, the focus of planetary health. So I have a fantastic, and it just was just published actually, and I gave it to um, some of our leads at UBC and SFU to read because this is what's going on when they say, well, there's one health and what you described, and then there's planetary health. And so I, I just actually brought this up, and I, I knew, I'm so glad you uh, asked that. It says, uh, One Health and Planetary Health, and like I said, it was just uh, published research fields um, and the interconnection between these fields and a global map of the most productive research hubs during the pandemic. Animal health, specifically zoonosis, example, antimicrobial resistance and emerging infectious diseases, remains the most prominent One Health research field. Whereas planetary health research does not address animal health. Planetary health focuses more on the environment, particularly climate change and human health, and on social determinants of human health. Yet climate change is not unique to planetary health research, and we observe increasing overlaps with the broadening of One Health. These overlaps can generate confusion, and it would be helpful to further clarify the relative focus of One Health and planetary health research, mainly because they often involve different disciplines and communities. So I hope that's helpful. I, would, I wouldn't mind uh, somehow sharing that with you because the group that I'm working with right now in Canada, and I won't mention any names, but some of them you will know, um, are veterinarian medicine. Uh, they are also biologists, physicians. Uh, it turns out uh, nursing. There's a variety of us working, and so in terms of what we're putting forth, we were grappling with: Do we call this planetary health and the environment, planetary health and well-being? For some of the work that we're looking at um, at a major research institute here in Canada. So I hope that does clarify. Um, there's a bit of uh, uh, some overlap, of course, and oftentimes the um, pictorial that I use in class is where I have planetary health is the umbrella, and then I have One Health, and then global health and public health is usually the way that uh, I uh, talk about it. Um, so hopefully that helps, as well as uh, what you spoke about is a, is definitely a, a global health challenge, which I have written about. So I have a chapter on that. So when we think about uh, nursing, um, uh, just the overlap between our, um, that's why we need to work together. So I just thought I would mention that because that is something we even have a position statement on globally um, in nursing uh, on what you talked about.
Okay. So thanks for that question. I was ready for you. <laughs> I, I, hey, yeah. any, any other questions you want to try and stump the audience with here? <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, I just question for Dr. So with uh, maybe all the issues of the pandemic for the resistance, where do you think the research and allocation of resources should be put towards with the era of discovery of the pyramid? What types of synthetic products? Can you repeat the question. Oh, gosh. We should keep it. <laughs> can, um, but he's asking that with the issue of um, AMR, where should some of our f- um, monies be going, right? In terms of is it should be the discover- in discovering new products or doing other things. Is that correct, Nate? Yeah. So my, in my opinion, I think, and where this is actually, the research is actually going, is looking for other alternatives beyond um, traditional antibiotics. So as I mentioned in class, my research, I look at alternatives. So for example, we look at, um, I look at Staphylococcus species that cause skin disease. So we look at things like honey. Uh, we are also working with Dr. Durbach hopefully creating as nanoparticles soon <laughs> so that we can look at other alternatives because it's been found that that discovery void is going nowhere and pharmaceutical companies are not interested in antibiotic, you know, finding antibiotic solutions anymore. So we have to look outside. We have to think outside the box um, for alternatives. So I think this is where we should be focused or a lot of the funding is going to be focused on looking at alternatives that go beyond um, traditional chemotherapeutics. Make sense? Okay. Good. Okay, one, one more question. Thank you, Dr. Bob. I know that you're talking about the green plastics, and yeah. it's always interesting to find because I'm like, is this really green? Or the straws that you see from paper that, that are made of paper but have the plastic lining inside? And I guess what I'm wondering is, the, pl- the biodegradable forks and knives that you get in other systems nowadays, is that also especially biodegradable with, um, like, like you were saying earlier, that those types of plastics, they need a special way of decomposing them? Yeah. yeah. Is there, yeah. Uh, are they moving towards some kind of plastic that would be biodegradable in right. a normal setting? So um, the the, que- the question there is, you, you know, you come across this word biodegradable and you go, yay, this is knife and fork, this is a straw, this obviously is biodegradable, I'm doing my thing for the planet, right? And then you discover, uh, actually, uh, it doesn't really degrade in the ground the way I expected it because the way that the plastics have been designed is that the heat and the pressure and where they find themselves with the, that is what does it, if they're not in that special environment, they actually don't degrade. Or if they do, they do very, very slowly. Um, are we doing something about it? Yeah, I think there's a lot of people who are trying to do things about that um, in terms of the plastics that we're using so that they do degrade, but not in the special, they do degrade. The problem with that is shelf life. Right. So if you have something that's going to degrade and you've now made tons of that and it doesn't get used, that's money down the drain. So companies are not as interested in doing something like that. So there's a push and pull. There's definitely a push and pull. Okay, so conscious of time here, I really want to give the last word to the four panelists. So if I could have the four student panelists come and take your places here. We, uh, faculty at Trinity, make no secret about it. The reason Trinity is such a great place is because of the students. So that's why we need to hear the student voices because they're the future. We have created the Anthropocene troubles, the depressing things we heard about. Um, This is the hope right here. So uh, the four students are Lauren McKenna, Rhea Klar, Una Cheng, and Portia McCracken. And I could talk a lot about all four of them, but I'll let them tell their own story here. So just uh, start with Portia. Thank you, Dr. Clements. Yeah, I'm Portia McCracken. I am the FNAS representative on TUSA, so the Student Association for Trinity Western. Um, so I kind of help plan events and ad- advocate for our students to um, to the Student Association. So what I'm involved with and kind of maybe the future hope um, that we can um, kind of discuss here, um, my initiative this semester has been towards a community garden. So um, I've been in the works with um, the Dean, Dr. Van Brennemelen, um, and with um, proposal committees 
um, and the campus planning committee um, towards um, getting a permanent um, garden on campus. Um, so we are in the process of making a master document, which will have building plans um, and also support um, the proposals and um, what we're further going to do with that. Um, because the plan is to um, have a garden that can um, produce food, um, but also be a learning opportunity for many students, um, whether that would be through research projects um, or studies that we can do through there. Um, this is kind of in cooperation with the Eco Stewardship Committee on TUSA, um, so the Student Association again, as well as with the Environmental Club, um, which will be soon the Planetary Health Club, but they'll touch on that here. Um, so this is um, kind of just the planning through that, and that will be continued by Ria, who will be the next um, FNAS representative, um, kind of continuing um, getting the proposals um, finished for that. But I'll let them talk about that. Perfect. Before she lets them talk about that, I will talk a little bit about something else, and that is the uh, Planetary Health Report Card Initiative. So um, this was actually spearheaded by a fourth-year champion named Johan. He's unable to be here due to preceptorship, but I'm here to share about the work that we did. And we were uh, mentored by our wonderful school of nursing faculty, Dr. Astel, as well as Professor Bransma, um, in doing this initiative for the first time as a first nursing school in Canada, which was really exciting. So this is a student level transdisciplinary and international initiative first started by medical students, but it's increasingly used in other disciplines such as nursing. And basically, it's a metric-based system where students evaluate uh, the planetary health content that's in the school's cu curriculum. And in addition to evaluating the curriculum, other areas of evaluation includes interdisciplinary research, community outreach, advocacy, support for student-led initiatives, and campus sustainability. So led by uh, Johan um, we had a group of nursing students, including Malaya, who's sitting right here, um, uh, mentored by Dr. Astell and Professor Bansma, and we did it for the first time. And our overall uh, grade that we've got was a B um, specific, which is pretty good, <laughs> uh, second best, but uh, definitely uh, room for improvement for future years. And in the curriculum area, this is specific to the School of Nursing and the courses that we analyzed in all four years. Um, it was an A and recommendations, including uh, miss, like including the missing metrics that we have in the courses that we have. For interdisciplinary research, we got a B. And recommendations that stem from that is for the School of Nursing to become more part of a key planetary health association, as well as for community outreach and advocacy, uh, C plus. So creating interdisciplinary clubs and events and targeted at climate justice, definitely one area that we're moving towards to improve um, our metric score in that, as well as student led initiatives. So we collaborated or we had a lot of discussion with the uh, Trinity Environmental Club on the initiatives that they were doing in their community and finding ways for collaboration moving forward. And um, for campus sustainability, uh, it was a C minus. So the area for both, uh, for the most, um, addressing needed and, uh, recommendations that stemmed out of that was presentations of findings and guidelines to executive level leadership, um, and developing like guidelines for events and training sessions, uh, specifically hosted by the School of Nursing. Awesome. Um, thank you. So I'm just going to share a little bit about myself. I'm Ria Klar. I'm the Vice President of the Environmental Club, and I'm also the Faculty of Natural and Applied Sciences representative next year. I also got to attend the United Nations COP27 conference in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt with Sarah Damien um, this past November. I am also currently um, one of the top three finalists for the Langley Youth Environmental Award um, coming up. So kind of my um, desire for to, to see where environmentalism goes is I really want to um, advocate for the human health aspect of environmentalism. So um, supporting Una and her work and also um, continuing Portia's work with um, the community garden next year. I also really want to advocate for how um, transdisciplinary um, this area of um, science is and how business is affected, animals are affected, human health is affected and how it's um, an overarching um, area in science. 
And um, I'm hoping to continue this work next year as a science representative and and advocating also um, environmentalism through a Christian lens. That's something I've had a really big calling from um, God is teaching Christians why it's important to take care of his creation and why it's important to be stewards of his creation. And yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Lauren McKenna, and I am currently the president for the Environmental Club at this school. And that work has led to some amazing connections. And I have loved this past year. And this is my second year being on the Environmental Club. And I hope to see many more years going forward, just being involved. And being the president of the Environmental Club has led me to organize many events. And the goal of all of these events is just to get people aware. At a base level, we just want people on campus to be aware of the issues. We want people to be aware of the C minus <laughs> that the campus has gotten for sustainability reasons. And we want to show students that they personally can make a difference. It can be on a community level. It can be on a larger scale level. But we want to advocate as the club that each individual person at the school can make a difference. And it's not lost hope. We want to give hope by having a support group. Because this club doesn't just offer um, opportunities to do um, sustainable events, but it also offers hope that there are community groups that you can join and it, that you can um, attend and get help for, you know, motivation to be more environmentally sustainable. And that's Michael. Sorry, and I just wanted to add how much um, we appreciate all of your guys' help because truly it is our generation that is going to be impacted um, by climate change. And it is incredible to have all of you guys come here and pave the way. And whether it be in your research or your advocacy or your passion for this, it's you guys protecting our futures and it's us fighting for the futures of our children and future generations. So I just thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts for um, coming here together and um, being a part of Sustainability Week. Yeah, so on that note, maybe, um, Lauren, you can just uh, let them know what the rest of Sustainability Week entails. <laughs> All right, so many of you probably know that Sustainability Week is this week, and that is hosted by the Environmental Club. And so this week, we've already had a lot of events. We've had in the past, we had a bat walk, which was super successful. This morning, we brought a um, solar panel that charged phones, supported by, <laughs> yeah, supported by um, Mr. Stevenson. So thank you for that. That was awesome. Um, we had a conservation biology walk this morning, which was also great. We saw, we keep on seeing pretty good numbers coming out. So usually between 20 and 30 people who are interested and in wanting to be there. Um, moving forward, though, we have a couple events. So on Wednesday, which is tomorrow morning, we have a bird walk with Dr. Clements uh, at 8 a.m. till 9. So early morning, but that means you get to see the best birds, I believe. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that'll be very interesting. And my thought with the bat walk, the bird walk, is to get people connected with nature. So if people are connected with nature and know nature, especially just on campus, they can find thought and inspiration to maybe protect it a little bit more and not litter because maybe they'd say, oh, I like the species here. I don't want to litter on this area. Um, that was kind of my thought. Tomorrow night, we also have a play that is run by, I can't remember, CEO. Yes, Skyo, <laughs> Skyo, see you. <laughs> yes, and that is tomorrow night, I believe at 7, 7 p.m., and you just have to buy tickets for that, um, but it sounds amazing. And on Thursday night, we have an awesome swap and shop event where Rhea is actually um, organizing that event. It'll be at the pavilion, the Ubuntu pavilion at 5.30 to 7.30, and that is an opportunity for students. It's the end of the semester to swap and shop other people's clothing items, kitchen items, anything, because at this point in the semester, a lot of garbage gets thrown away. We get a lot of um, people don't want this kitchen utensil anymore, or they're moving out, and they're just dumping things, and they're throwing things away, and we want to emphasize that impact of reusing 
because recycling doesn't always work, <laughs> right? As we learned, we want to emphasize reusing, especially when you already have those items. More importantly, reducing, but when you already have them, it's important to reuse them. And that's what the Thursday event is going to be about. And we really hope to do Sustainability Week as a yearly thing. We want to emphasize that sustainability is very important on campus, as you were saying with the <laughs> C minus. But our, okay. yeah, 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 room for improvement. And hopefully, this is one of them. And hopefully, just the notion of having a weekly, um, a monthly, sorry, a yearly event of Sustainability Week will get that um, thought process rolling. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. So after this, um, we'll have a chance to hang out with the refreshments. But first, just wanna want everyone to thank Lauren, Ria, Una, and Portia for excellent presentations. So thank you very much. Thank you.